Greetings to all. We are now in week four. Hope everyone is doing okay. Continuing with the oral lectures or the podcast format this week, our class will focus on the second and last part of historical background and overview of Philippine external relations. After going over the different external influences on the Philippine islands in the prehistoric, pre-colonial, Spanish colonial, and the first Philippine Republic periods last week, all of which dealt with foreign interactions by local individuals and groups or polities in the archipelago, which did not yet constitute a nation. This week, we now enter the 20th century, which essentially tells the first experience of Filipinos at self-rule, first under American tutelage, then a form of crisis governance under Japanese occupation, and then finally, independence and the establishment of the Third Philippine Republic. As usual, I will be providing other materials to illustrate or help complete your understanding of my lectures. By the end of week four, you will have enhanced your perspective on which factors and, inf and elements influence the evolution of the Philippines as a nation, eventually helping shape its foreign policy. Through your critical understanding of the various historical factors, it is hoped that you will have developed your skills in analyzing and evaluating the motivations leading to the formulation of certain policies and their results. So without further ado, let's all dive in. Welcome, FIFC students, to week four. This is Derek Atienza. We had some unfinished business from week three, specifically the third and last segment, the short-lived Philippine Republic, referring to the first Philippine Republic founded on 23 January 1899 on the basis of the Malolos Constitution and replaced in succession the revolutionary government of 23 June 1898 and the dictatorial government of 18 June 1898, all of which, or both of which, were led by Emilio Guinaldo. I say unfinished business because the Republic did not have international recognition either as a state or even as a belligerent due to devious acts taken by the United States and was reduced to a mere insurgency. The reasons for this are made clear in the three videos uploaded in Module 4, the United States Colonial Empire by the General Nor Knowledge Channel, the Philippine Insurrection, 1899-1913, and the word boondocks by the cynical historian, and the 1899 Philippine Republic that America still does not recognize but, but by Patricio Mercado Noel. One month before the establishment of the first Philippine Republic, the new nation's fate was sealed. President William McKinley proclaimed a policy of benevolent assimilation whereby the quote, future control, disposition, and government of the Philippine Islands were ceded to the United States, unquote, and that, quote, the military government is to be to the whole of the ceded territory, unquote. This happened 11 days after the signing of the Treaty of Paris, which ceded the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico to the United States with an, with an indemnity of U.S. $20 million to Spain for the improvements it had made on the colony. The U.S. military government transitioned into a civilian one on 1 July 1901, three months after the capture of President Aguinaldo. So now we move to the next part. Welcome to DWPFP, the podcast for Philippine foreign relations. This is your host, Stephanie Soares. We welcome again today our instructor and facilitator, Derek Atienza, who will discuss with us part two of the historical background with a focus on Philippine external relations. How have you been doing, Mr. Atienza? Thank you, Stephanie, for welcoming me, welcoming me to this podcast. I'm doing well. I'm looking forward to our discussions and hope our listeners will learn a lot from them today. I am certain we all will. We're continuing from last week's three-part lectures with the U.S. just having taken over the Philippines in events that were viewed as controversial even back in the day by many Americans, but were ultimately supported by the majority. If the landslide victory of William McKinley in 1900 is any indication. Yes, it's curious to note that the United States had to outmaneuver or seek the support of certain foreign powers on its way to becoming a world power itself. It had to threaten a German squadron lurking near Manila Bay and win um, British acceptance of the U.S. occupation of the Philippines. As the start of the Philippine-American War, the U.S., through its ambassador in Istanbul, 
requested the Ottoman Empire to persuade the Moro Sulu Muslims of the Sulu Sultanate in the Philippines to submit to American suzerainty and American military rule. Despite their pan-Islamic ideology, the Ottoman Turks re readily ac acceded to this request as they felt no need to cause hostilities between the West and Muslims. In addition to this letter from the Ottoman Sultan, the U.S. successfully forged an agreement with the Sulu Sultanate in order to concentrate its limited forces in suppressing the insurgency in northern Luzon. Eventually, the U.S. abandoned this agreement with Sulu following the pacification pacification of the islands in 1904, and the whole of Mindanao fell under American rule in 1913, leading to the end of the Sultanate's political power over territory within the Philippines in 1915. I do remember in the last session, you have mentioned that the Sulu Sultanate ignored an invitation by Aguinaldo to take part in the drafting of the Malolos Constitution, thereby signaling a certain aloofness and perhaps even non-recognition at the time, in 1898, of the central authority of the nascent republic. But anyways, with the Treaty of Paris in 1898, which was ratified by the U.S. Senate on 6 February 1899, two days after the start of the Philippine-American War, we have now moved to a new chapter of in the history of the islands, that is, the effective transfer of sovereignty of the islands from an old colonial power to a new one. Yes, and it bears mentioning that the Treaty of Paris was followed through by another treaty, the Treaty of Washington of 1900, which clarifies that the territories relinquished by Spain to the United States included any and all islands belonging to the Philippine archipelago, but lying outside the lines described in the Treaty of Paris. Specifically, this talks about islands in the Cagayan Sulu, uh, of Cagayan Sulu and Cebutu and their dependencies. These are actually islands um, ar around the Sulu area. In fact, it is the Treaty of Washington more than the Treaty of Paris, which is often quoted, that is actually the more authoritative document in defining the country's maritime limits prior to UNCLOS. Anyway, that's a discussion for another day. The establishment of a civilian government in the Philippines, or in proper term, the insular government, was laid out in the Philippine Organic Act of 1902, which effectively places the entire country under, under the supervision of the U.S. War Department's Bureau of Insular Affairs. So essentially, the civilian governor, later renamed Governor General, who was appointed by the U.S. President, was imbued with all military, civil, and judicial powers necessary to govern the Philippine Islands, since it was determined by the first Philippine Commission, led by Dr. Jacob Sherman, President of Cornell University, that Filipinos were not ready for self-government. This was the finding um, Dr. Sherman found um, had in 1899. Even Aguinaldo conceded after surrendering in 1901 that it was good that the U.S. had taken it upon itself to occupy the Philippines, otherwise it would have been broken up by competing world powers. When you say all civil powers, does that also mean foreign policy? Well, as a colony under American tutelage, we were no different than any subnational entity, like a dependency or protectorate. Most certainly, Filipinos were not even immediately involved in some basic aspects of government, like policing, defense, justice, legislation, and the like. Our participation in all these functions of government came about gradually, depending on our readiness or suitability for it. While there were some Filipinos, staunch nationalists for example, who demanded a fast track towards independence, there were others who opted for a process that focused less on time than on the conditions of independence, in particular that independence should come with guarantees from the United States since these people fear that too rapid independence from American rule without such guarantees might cause the Philippines to fall into Japanese hands. And so, with some lobbying by Filipino politicians, notably Manuel Quezon, who was one of two resident commissioners representing the Philippines in the House of Repres Representatives back then, the U.S. Congress approved the Philippine Autonomy Act of 1916, better known as the Jones Act, which contained the first formal and official declaration of the United States federal government's commitment to grant independence to the Philippines. There was, however, no fixed timetable for this. I suppose our students are familiar with all of this through the Philippine history course they've taken up in secondary school. 
That's right. But I would also like to point out that even though the Philippines was not able to have any say in its foreign policy at all, um, you know, not being full citizens, Filipinos, for example, cannot be conscripted or drafted into the United States Army. All the same, Filipinos suspended the independence campaign during first the First World War and supported the United States and um, Entente powers against the German Empire as a courtesy to, um, to the United States. So you see, Filipino citizens and their leaders were able to express their will through their representatives, initially elected through the Philippine Assembly in 1907, and then after the Jones Law or Jones Act in the bicameral bicameral legislature plus the american public as you can see had changed its attitude over the years about the occupation of the philippines seeing it more of a fiscal burden and definitely the idealized self-image america had about itself being different from european imperialists it's good to get this recap since history classes from high school sometimes just focus on names and don't really put a lot of things in the context so I'm sure our listeners would appreciate the review. At this point, we are about to get into the Commonwealth very soon, correct? Yeah, anytime soon. Um, but after World War I, the Philippine legislature, um, as it was then called uh, after the Jones Act, created a commission of independence to study ways and means of attaining the condition for independence. That is, according to Jones Act, the establishment of a stable government. So the demand of, uh, in, for independence prior to this had been voiced by means of formal resolutions of the Philippine Assembly, um, as it was called in 1907, and after 1916 of the Philippine legislature, delivered to the American Congress through Filipino resident commissioners in, commissioners in Washington, as I had mentioned. After the war, a more sustained effort to terminate American rule was undertaken with the appeal for freedom taken directly by the Filipinos to Washington through parliamentary missions or legislative committees sent by the Philippine legislature. So these were called independence missions. And independence missions um, were sent to the United States almost yearly. The first one went in 1919 and the last in 1933. There were probably around 12 in all. The presence of all these missions in Washington had significant influence on the final Independence Act. In the midst of the Great Depression, the United States finally decided to terminate her tutelage of the Filipinos and fulfill its promise of independence given by the Jones Act of 1916. The demand for independence by the independence missions to the United States, agitation by American farm and labor groups, and persistence of an anti-colonial conscience culminated in the passage of the tidings McDuffie Act in March 1934 which finally settled the Philippine issue. So in what way was the Tidings McDuffie Act different from the Jones Act? Unlike the less precise Jones Act, in which there was no um, specific timetable, the Tidings McDuffie or the Philippine Independence Act set a 10-year transition period to be known as the Commonwealth of the Philippines, followed by the recognition of the independence of the Philippines by the United States. It also established the parameters of the preparatory period. Some powers of supervision uh, were still reserved to the United States, such as foreign policy, military affairs, and military affairs and currency. In all other respects, though, the Philippines became self-governing. The Act also provided for the election of a constitutional convention to draft the Constitution of the Commonwealth, right? Yes, on condition that the draft constitution be certified by the President of the United States. Other limitations um, included the powers reserved to the U.S. government, for example, where currency, coinage, imports, exports, and immigration laws would require the approval of the U.S. President. The U.S. could also intervene in the processes of the Commonwealth via proclamation of the U.S. US President, while the U.S. Supreme Court had the right to review all decisions of the courts of the Philippines. In the end, these powers, though, were rarely exercised. During its more than a decade of existence, the Commonwealth had a strong executive in the person of Quezon. Yes, Quezon, who, would you believe, served as aide-de-camp to General Aguinaldo at age 20. And he was the first Filipino to head a government of the entire Philippines, and is considered to have been the second president of the Philippines after Emilio Aguinaldo. 
He is remembered for a notable humanitarian act, which one can characterize as a kind of foreign policy in itself. Um, Quezon, in cooperation with U.S. High Commissioner Paul B. McNutt, fa- facilitated the entry into the Philippines of Jewish refugees fleeing fascist regimes in Europe. They proposed to have 30,000 refugee families in Mindanao and 30,000 to 40,000 refugees on Polilio Island in Quezon. Well, what is now called Quezon. Quezon gave as a 10-year loan to Manila's uh, Jewish Refugee Committee land beside uh, the family home in Marikina. However, due to the interference by the United States government, Quezon was only able to welcome uh, 1,200 Jews from Germany and Austria with his open doors policy, um, I think by 1939. Many of our listeners are probably familiar with the story through the 2018 film, Quezon's Game. Yes, I do remember watching this during my own FIFASI class. But anyways, so even in a limited way, the Commonwealth of the Philippines was able to affect policies that had some impact on the Philippines' foreign relations. Yes, one can see that the Commonwealth took their work seriously in preparation for economic and political independence, which included, for example, such policies as national defense, um, when they uh, promulgated the National Defense Act of 1935, which in essence organized a conscription for service uh, in the country. And um, on the eve of World War II, the Commonwealth also placed the Philippine Army under the command of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East. Of course, the war interrupted the Commonwealth's program of government. But under the presidency of Sergio Osmeña, who served as the second president upon the death of Quezon in 1944, we start seeing the makings of our own foreign policy as a nation. Like, even before independence, Osmeña sent a Philippine delegation, which was headed by Carlos P. Romulo, to the San Francisco meeting for the promulgation of the Charter of the United Nations on 26th of June, 1945, thus making the Philippines one of the one of the 51 charter members of the UN. The Philippines also became a member of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank, which are collectively called the Bretton Woods system. But what about the Department of Foreign Affairs? Was there some preparation done before independence? Well, something to that effect. Um, Osmeña created the Office of Foreign Relations to prepare for the forthcoming independence status of the Philippines, Part of this idea was to enter uh, into an agreement with the United States government to send five Filipino trainees to the U.S. State Department to prepare themselves for diplomatic service. So these trainees were sent by the U.S. State Department to the United States embassies in Moscow, Mexico City, and consulates in Saigon and Singapore. So as you can see, the Commonwealth had a lot of foresight considering that the war had just ended at that time. Yes, it's really interesting to consider if the Commonwealth would have been more successful had its preparations for independence had not been interrupted by the war. Which, by the way, is our next topic. But for now, we're signing off. Catch you at the next segment, everyone.